This story was submitted by one of the subscribers of our Broccoli fam, Jacqueline. Special thanks to her for sharing her story. Kudos to her for being an awesome person and staying strong through all these years. When my ex-boyfriend Mike texted me to see if I'd be willing to come over and talk, I tried not to think much of it. We broke up three years ago, so I was curious to see what it was all about. Maybe he wanted to catch up with me, or things didn't work out with his ex-wife, who he went back to when he broke it off with me. Mike and I met in high school and dated on and off since then, so we've known each other for about 20 years and spent 11 years in a relationship. During one of the periods when we weren't together, he met Haley. They fell in love, got married, and had two kids. Unfortunately, Haley didn't turn out to be the most stable person, or mom, so Mike ended up leaving her. When they went to court, Haley lost custody of her kids because at the time she was deep in addiction. After he left her, Mike and I reconnected and picked things back up. When I came back into the picture, Mike's two kids were about three and five years old. He struggled to provide for them and be a present father, so I stepped in to help. It was my pleasure. I loved Mike, so loving and caring for his kids was easy. For six years, I helped raise those two kids. I made sure they had nice clothes to wear to school, packed their lunches, helped with their homework, comforted them when they had nightmares, and tried to show up for them as I could. When their mom learned that I stepped up when she couldn't, she began sending me these horrible, hateful messages. She went as far as to threaten my life for raising her kids. Mike told me not to worry about her and that she wouldn't bother us per court order. Haley posed no issue for us until three years ago when Mike decided to get back together with her so his kids could have their real mom back. It broke my heart for him to leave, but I guess I can understand that he wanted to reunite his kids with their biological mom. When he told me we needed to break up, he stressed that he didn't really want to get back together with Haley, but it seemed like the right thing for his kids. Apparently, Haley had done a lot of work to get clean to be in her kids' lives once again. It was difficult to let go of him and those kids, but I don't care to be where I'm not wanted. So when he texted me out of the blue a couple of weeks ago to talk, it surprised me. The last I'd heard, he was still with his ex, who despised me, so what could we have to talk about? Since we've known each other for so long, I agreed. I got ready for the day and headed over to his place. I walked up to his door and knocked. He opened the door with a sigh. Hey, Jackie. Mike, I responded. He invited me in and offered to sit at his kitchen table. Any chance you have a cigarette to spare? He asked. I checked my pack, and I, in fact, did not. I only had two left in the pack. Would you mind if I ran to the corner store to get a new pack? Yeah, do what you need to do, he told me. I rushed out the door and walked to the store. I bought two packs and headed back. This time, I lightly knocked and opened the door myself. I walked into the kitchen to see Haley had joined Mike at the table. She glared at me like a lion hunting prey. Well, well, well. If it isn't the woman who tried to replace me, Haley started. Can we please not do this? I said. Mike said, can you please sit down and talk with us? Absolutely not. Not with that unhinged bitch, I said, backing up. I started towards the door and almost made it when a hand reached into my hair and yanked me back. Haley wrapped her other arm around my neck and dragged me back into the kitchen. With one hand, I pulled her arm down, which had me in a chokehold so I could breathe, and I used my other to punch her in the face. She recoiled back at this blow. Before I could make it out, she grabbed my arm and with all her strength whipped me onto the couch. She straddled me and wrapped her hands around my throat, completely cutting off airflow. I struggled to breathe and tried to push her face to get her away from me, but she was stronger. The more I fought back, the tighter her grip got. I couldn't even think of Mike, who was just watching this all happen. He just sat back and watched as his deranged ex-wife was killing me. I genuinely thought that was it. 
I was going to die at the hands of a mother who was mad at me for stepping in when she was unfit. Just as I started to see Black, I heard Mike say, Let her go, Haley. Haley listened to his command, and air rushed back into my lungs. She climbed off me and spat on me as I lay there gasping for breath. She reached her hand into my pocket to grab my phone. I'll give this back after you talk to us. Don't want you recording me or anything, she sneered. They sat back down at the kitchen table and waited for me. Slowly, I stood up and walked over, holding my throat. She had gripped my throat so tightly that my voice was raspy. <laughs> what do you guys want? Haley launched into an angry monologue, demanding to know what gave me the right to raise her kids for those six years. I kept looking at Mike, who needed the help, but he sat there silently. He let her choke me, and now he let her verbally rip me to shreds. I sat there for 40 minutes listening to her go on and on about how wrong it was for me to raise her kids instead of her. I urged her to see reason that I was merely helping Mike. It's not like I tried to file for custody of her kids. I just stepped in when they needed help. Haley kept interrupting me with her nonsense. Once she got it out of her system, I said, Okay, can I go now? The two nodded their heads, and Haley gave me back my phone. Before I left, I turned to Mike and said, Do not contact me again. I shook my head at Haley and left. In the days following, dark bruises formed around my neck. I had to use foundation to try to cover them up for work so people wouldn't ask me what had happened. I expected that kind of behavior from Haley, but I was disturbed that Mike let her ambush me. He just stood there, watching her strangle me for at least three minutes. He watched me struggle to breathe, trying to push her off, and he could have stopped at any time. Why wait as long as he did? This is a man I've known since we were teenagers. I had loved him at one point, and he loved me. I trusted him enough to come over when he requested to talk. Just goes to show you never really know someone. If you want your story with your animated avatar to be featured on the channel, send an email to broccolianimations at gmail.com. On to the next story now. My name is Joanne. I'm 28 years old and I just got out of a three-year relationship. Things ended pretty badly, so I was planning to just stay single for a while. But then I met Lori at a gay bar. She was a little older than me, but she was absolutely gorgeous. We hit it off right away. After our second date, I knew that I was starting to have real feelings for her. I came out when I was a teenager, so I'd only ever dated women. But Lori came from a pretty religious family. She married a man named Tom, and they were together for three years before she finally told him that she was a lesbian. She said that I was her first real girlfriend, so she'd really like to take things slow. We had been seeing each other for about a month when Valentine's rolled around. I wanted to make the day special. I was hoping that we'd finally take our relationship to the next level. So I sent flowers to the real estate office where she worked and made dinner reservations for her favorite Italian restaurant. Things went really well at first. We got to the restaurant and had an amazing meal. But as we were leaving, Joanne's mood completely changed. She looked terrified. She grabbed me by the arm and practically dragged me back to the car. When we got in the car, Joanne locked all the doors and then pointed toward the side of the parking lot. She was pointing toward a man standing alone near the side of the building. That's Tom, my ex-husband. What's he doing here? He's following us. She sounded so scared. She turned on the car and started driving, but there was something wrong. It took us both a second to realize that all four tires were flat. I opened the door to get a better look and saw that someone had slashed her tires. I looked over to where Tom had been standing, but he wasn't there anymore. I pulled out my phone to call the police, but Lori grabbed it from me. We don't have any time. Come on. Before I could argue, she raced out of the car and started running toward the street. The only thing I could do was follow her. 
We both ran as fast as we could. Lori kept looking over her shoulder to see if Tom was chasing us. If he was, we couldn't see him. Eventually, Lori turned onto a side street and I followed. I was starting to get pretty scared. I'd never seen Lori this upset before. And now we were on a dark residential street with no one nearby. It didn't seem safe. She led me toward a two-story house at the end of the street. I thought she was going to knock on the door and ask for help, but instead, she pulled out a house key and rushed inside. I followed her in. Where are we? She explained that this was one of the houses that her real estate office was trying to sell. She thought this would be the safest place for us to wait. She locked the door behind her and told me to check the other locks. As I walked around the house, Lori explained that Tom had been following her all day. She'd spotted him outside her office and then again at an open house. He said he wanted to get back together with her, but she told him no. She worried that he was turning violent, and with her car's tires slashed, she was right. When I finished checking all the locks, I got back to the living room and gave Lori a big hug. I absolutely hated that we were stuck in a situation like this. I was scared, but I couldn't imagine how scared she must have felt. She got on her phone and called the police. I could only hear her side of the conversation, but it sounded like they were telling us to stay where we were and wait for an officer to arrive. She ended the call and then assured me that everything was going to be okay. She walked into the kitchen and came back with a glass of wine. She didn't drink, so I knew it was for me. She handed it to me and said it would help calm my nerves. Lori and I sat together. I drank some of the wine and finally started to feel safe again. That's when I realized that there was something strange about this house. If it was an empty house that she was trying to sell, then why did it have wine? Why were there magazines on the table and photos on the walls? I took a good look at the place. It definitely looked like it was a house where people lived. I noticed a giant crucifix on the wall, along with a bunch of pictures of Jesus and framed Bible quotes. Then, I looked closer at the family photos on the mantle, and I gasped. The photos were all of Lori and Tom. This wasn't a house Lori was trying to sell. This was Lori's house, the one she lived in with her husband. I started to ask what was going on, but the words wouldn't come out of my mouth. I felt really woozy. Lori had put something in my drink. It looks like you figured it out. A bit too late, though. She laughed coldly. Then she explained that she was still married to Tom. They were very happy together. She nodded toward the crucifix on the wall, saying that she and her husband were deeply religious. They took it upon themselves to find wayward women, like me. They just wanted to help me. To fix me. She explained some other things too, but I could barely hear what she was saying. I was seconds away from passing out. I heard the front door unlock and saw Tom walk in. Lori had lied to me about everything. Our relationship has never been real. Nothing she told me was real. This whole night had been one long game that she and Tom were playing and I was the pawn. I couldn't keep my eyes open. I couldn't move. I kept trying to fight against the in my system, but it was no use. I fell asleep. I don't know how long I was out, but when I woke up, Lori was standing over me with a roll of duct tape. She was halfway through tying me to the couch. Tom stood off to the side, watching his wife and smiling in approval. He had a box in his hands. I had no idea what was inside or what they were planning to do to fix me. Is she awake? Tom asked. I quickly closed my eyes as Lori examined my face. I didn't want them to know that I had already woken up. Nope. Out like a light. Get ready. She was about to finish taping my wrist to the couch. It was now or never. I quickly raised my arm and punched Lori right in the face. From a sitting position, I wasn't able to use a lot of force. But Lori was still caught off guard. She fell backwards and landed hard on the glass coffee table. It shattered under her. Tom rushed forward to hold me down, but by the time he reached me, I was already standing. My feet were taped together, so I wasn't very steady. But I was able to grab him by the neck and squeeze until he couldn't breathe. He begged for me to stop, 
but his words could barely come out. I didn't stop. I kept squeezing and squeezing until he lost consciousness and fell onto the ground. Lori stood up. We were just trying to help you. Of course you were. Thank you so much. I used all the strength I had to punch her again. My fist connected with her nose and she fell backwards, back onto the broken table. That gave me enough time to peel off the tape around my ankles and run out of there. I hid in a neighbor's yard and made a real call to the police. By the time they got there, the house was empty. Lori and her husband must have left out the back. The police found them two days later. I'm excited for the trial. Can't wait to testify against them. It's been over a month since this all happened, and I'm once again single. I have no complaints. The first time the roses appeared, I was just about to leave for work. I was running a little late, so I practically tripped out of my apartment and slammed the door, almost trampling on the beautiful bouquet of flowers sitting on the mat behind me. I blinked in surprise at the mysterious gift glancing down the hall as if expecting to see someone waiting for me, but I was alone. Crouching down, I picked up the roses and searched for a tag or note, but there was nothing. Whoever had left them there clearly wanted to remain anonymous. The flowers were sweet and fragrant, at least a dozen of them with blood-red petals and leafy stems. Knowing I would be late for work regardless, I unlocked my apartment and headed back inside to put them in water. If only I knew who they were from. The second time the roses appeared, dusk was already falling outside. I was lounging in my apartment after a long day of work when I heard someone knocking on the door. It was more like scratching, like fingertips scraping against wood, so I peered through the peephole first. At the very edge of the corridor, I glimpsed a shadow disappear around the corner, a flicker of movement and then stillness. With a frown, I unlatched the chain and opened the door, stepping out. The corridor was empty, but another bouquet of roses were sitting on the mat. It was only a couple of days since the last one. I knew Valentine's Day was right around the corner, but I wasn't seeing anyone, and I had no idea who could be leaving these roses for me. I was simultaneously pleased and unnerved by their appearance, especially after seeing that mysterious shadow. Someone clearly didn't want me to see them, but why? Shaking the thoughts away, I reached down for the roses, wincing when I pricked my finger on a thorn. Blood immediately welled, staining part of the stem red. Great, I muttered under my breath, trying not to focus on the soft sting in my finger. Well, at least the thorn hadn't gotten stuck in my flesh. That would have been painful. Throwing one last glance down the hall, I hurried back into my apartment and locked the door, careful not to touch any more thorns. These roses smelled less fresh than the last ones, with some of the petals already wiltering, but they still smelled sweet. I put them in the same vase as the others after cutting some of the stems, setting them on the cupboard in my open sitting dining area. Well, they at least added a splash of color to the otherwise drab looking apartment. Still, not knowing who they were from bothered me. I wish they'd at least left a note. A week before Valentine's Day, I got my third bouquet. I was at work when one of the office administrators, Mary, came over to me holding the roses. Liz, look what you got, she said excitedly, thrusting the flowers into my face. Someone left these at the front desk. It has your name on it. I quickly snatched them out of her hand and looked for the tag, but the only thing it said was Elizabeth in printed script. Still no sender's name. Did you see who left them? I asked desperately. Mary shook her head, shrugging cluelessly. Didn't see. When I came back from my break, they were just sitting there. Did anyone see who left them? Mary's brows furrowed. No, I don't think so. Why? I sighed, putting the roses on my desk. The petals were crumpled, browning around the edges. This is the third bouquet I've got this week. I just want to know who keeps leaving them. Oh, that's romantic, Mary said, but I shrugged. Maybe, unless it's some stalker, I mumbled. 
If they knew where I lived and where I worked, it had to be someone who knew me. But who? I threw a vague glance across the room. It couldn't be any of my co-workers. None of them had ever shown interest in me, and most were already married. Who else could it be? Mary left, and I stared at the roses. A slightly putrid smell wafted from them, like they'd been left in a dark warehouse for a while. I hesitated for only a second before tossing them into the bin. I didn't need this many roses, especially from some stranger. I just wish they would reveal themselves soon. A few days later, I was jolted awake in the middle of the night by someone knocking at my door. I sat up in bed, bleary-eyed and groggy, staring into the darkness of my room. Outside, the pale crescent of the moon silvered the windowsill, shadows creeping along the walls. The apartment had gone silent now, but the echo of the knock still rang in my ears. Was someone at the door? I threw back the covers and climbed out of bed, switching on a lamp as I shuffled past. It was just past midnight, far too late for a visitor. Unless it was an emergency. Maybe one of my neighbors needed help. Stifling a yawn, I switched the light on in the hallway and walked up to the door, checking the peephole. The corridor outside was empty. Something strange tugged at my stomach. A little bit of fear mixed with apprehension. Who had been knocking? Had I just dreamt it? But part of me knew that when I opened the door, something would be waiting for me on the mat, just like all those other times. I swallowed, freezing, with my hand on the doorknob. I could wait until morning to check. It was late, and I was working early tomorrow. In the end, I gave in and opened the door. As expected, a bouquet of roses were sitting on the mat outside. This time, the roses were half dead. Some of them were withered and curled, their brown petals breaking off when I picked up the flowers from the floor. There was a sharp, tangy smell rising from them, like old soil and roots. And like the last ones, they would be going straight in the bin. Why would they leave me rotting roses? It was starting to creep me out now, since I was still no closer to figuring out who was behind it. I couldn't even tell if the gesture was supposed to be romantic anymore, or something else. I retreated back into the apartment, locking the door and sliding the chain through the latch. The thought of someone visiting my apartment in the middle of the night didn't sit well with me. Maybe I should set up a camera or something. That way I could catch whoever it was in the act and confront them about it. I tossed the roses straight into the trash and went back to bed. Valentine's Day finally rolled around the following Wednesday. I hadn't received a bouquet of roses since that midnight drop-off a few nights ago, and I had hoped that the whole charade was finally at an end. I was wrong. When I got home later that evening, after spending all day burying myself at work, I knew that something was off. The door to my apartment was sitting ajar, shadows bleeding out into the hallway. Fear clenched my gut as I approached the door, breathing shallowly. Someone broken into my apartment? There was no way I would have left it open like that, even if I had been in a rush that morning. Swallowing back the lump in my throat, I walked up to the door and slowly pushed it open with my fingers. Inside was dark, and it took a second for my eyes to adjust, but I couldn't see anyone. Instincts told me to call the police before I did anything rash, but I didn't want to waste their time if it turned out to be a false alarm. Instead, I pushed the door open wider and stepped inside. The entire apartment was silent. Nothing stirred. Since I was still close to the door, I switched the light on, letting it flood out into the open kitchen dining area. There was one change that became immediately noticeable to me. The roses I had kept on my sideboard were gone. Instead, a single bouquet sat in the middle of the kitchen table. The petals were a dark, grimy brown color, and the stems were twisted and broken, black thorns sticking out. The flowers were rotten. I took a step closer and almost gagged on the smell. They smelled like something that had been left in the dark for too long. Something putrid and sick. What the hell was going on? Who had left these here? 
Had they broken into my apartment? That's when I noticed the note sitting beside the flowers. Pinching my nose, I walked over to it and read the black script. I barely read the words when the door behind me slammed shut and something hard hit the back of my neck, sending me to my knees. The rotten roses were the last thing I saw before my mind faded to black. This is what you did to my heart, and it's what I'll do to yours.